Hi everyone, my name is Jovana and I'm going to be talking about memes and neuroethology. So a little bit about my background. I have a master's degree in medical neuroscience and I worked with both uh, human subjects and rodents on a variety of topics, including like auditory neuroscience, play behavior, kinship, uh, cannibalism. So you could say that my background in neuroscience is um, fairly broad. However, right now I'm mainly interested in uh, systems neurobiology and animal behavior. And I'm kind of planning to go in that direction in the future. So uh, at the moment, I'm doing my PhD at the uh, Ernst Strungmann Institute, which is in Frankfurt. Um, and my project involves investigating how primate brains navigate in three-dimensional space. So in particular, I'm working with uh, marmoset monkeys and I'm recording their neural activity while they navigate in different um, spatial conditions. So in case you don't know, uh, neuroethology is a discipline that combines neuroscience and ethology. And if ethology is also a word that you, you know, haven't heard either, um, what this is, is basically the study of animal behavior, focusing on how behavior arises in um, natural conditions and um, viewing the development of behavior as sort of evolutionary um, adaptive traits. So you might think that this is a weird combination of topics, and it is, uh, but I just wanna clarify that this talk is going to be mostly my own speculation, um, which is gonna be based on real studies in animal neurobiology um, and behavior. And I think it's uh, useful for ourselves to sometimes um, displace from this um, human perspective and consider other forms of conditions, uh, cognitions and um, kind of investigate the insights that they might offer into any complex human behavior, um, which includes something like online meme culture. So I know that this talk um, is gonna include a lot of new concepts um, from neuroscience. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in the previous year, uh, mostly I began thinking about whether a neuroscience of online memes exists or whether it can exist at all. And part of this thinking process, including uh, like talking to a lot of people, but also um, I started looking into current studies and cognitive neuroscience and neuroimaging to see if anyone actually started looking at uh, brain responses to processing of digital memes and humor. And uh, of course, I was aware that memes, especially at this level of like heavy semantic layering have really exploded after the pandemic and that um, this would have affected this um, sort of research process. Um, but also I think that all of us can appreciate uh, the deep transformation that internet memes have undergone in the last couple of years where meaning seems to be uh, not only constantly evading but sometimes even completely out of our reach. That being said, I did find several review articles in cognitive neuroscience, um, like this one by Adam McNamara, which tackled the question of whether we can measure memes using fMRI. And what's important to note here is that um, this review article focused on memes in the traditional like, Dawkinsonian sense, um, which are defined as units of cultural transmission, which operate through like sort of viral mechanisms of imitation and replication. And uh, it is thought that they represent uh, the primary driving force for the development of human intellect, but also indirectly brain size, which is something that we're going to revisit uh, later in the talk again. So sometime uh, between the appearance of the first uh, stone tools, which were created by Homo habilis 2.5 million years ago, and the arrival of Homo erectus 1.5 million years ago. Our ancestors developed a considerably larger brain and a more advanced mimetic culture. So it's claimed that imitation um, added serious advantage to imitators as they rapidly learned skills like fire making, hunting tactics uh, from others, avoiding um, these less efficient trial and error approaches. Also um, computer simulations of this kind of uh, imitative phenotype within a population 
um, manage to predict uh, increases in learning ability, um, the number of memes as imitated actions per individual, um, and also the, the overall fitness of the individual. So this occurred independent of whether this imitated behavior was selected for its negative or positive effect. Um, basically, in other words, the imitation as a novel strategy for learning um, predicts increases in population fitness, independent of how well or how badly it's judged by the meme recipient. Also, it's interesting um, to note that this sort of change in evolution occurs even when there's considerable negative consequences on the fitness of an individual. For example, um, increased difficulties with childbirth due to an increased head size. So even though I spent a lot of time interacting with memes, surprise, uh, it was always really difficult for me to imagine performing neuroimaging experiments to study internet meme processing in real time or at least to be able to find a neural correlate to this process. Also, just simply placing people in an fMRI scanner while they look at in random Instagram memes, which is kind of the first thing I think about when you know, envisioning an experiment, um, it raises a number of experimental um, and analysis concerns. For example, there's a lot of difficulty in controlling all the confounding variables which might um, arise in this very ambiguous uh, process of interacting with memes today. So it's important to know that I don't specialize in cognitive neuroscience. Um, so, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, if we were to imagine that this type of experiment was hypothetically possible, you would have um, to use a completely different approach. So with traditional memes, uh, what you could do is perhaps perform longitudinal studies ranging from hours to weeks uh, that would measure changes in connectivity between brain regions to specific components of cultural evolution. Like for example, a specific um, behavior or maybe a specific political belief. And that way you could observe this connectivity profile um, dynamics of memes as they are learned and modulated over time. So it's really important to emphasize that this, this would have to be a dynamic experiment that kind of develops over time. Um, so if a region uh, changes activity as a consequence of changes in the meaning of a meme, um, then it, is, it can be considered as a component of this meme itself um, and the way it's represented in the brain. But the big problem that I see with uh, online memes is that we don't have an appropriate psychological framework for defining them yet. And without it, it's very, very difficult to navigate the complex and noisy environments of our brains. Another huge issue is that um, this traditional definition of a meme relies really heavily on a sort of presence or at least an aura of meaning. Um, and in an experimental setting, it would use meaning as a proxy for like meme induced um, functional neuronal changes. While internet memes as we know them today seem to really often evade clear definitions of meaning or kind of, um, yeah, basically meaning, um, because meaning is layered in so many ways, it seems to be a little bit of a different phenomenon than this traditional idea. So, Psychologically, this would make it extremely difficult, uh, difficult to pinpoint a general component that you could focus on when performing a neuroimaging experiment. Okay, so now before I go into um, neuroethology, I want to first address a few issues that were raised by Mitch um, Anzuoni in his radio show from January 19th called neural narratives, computational propaganda, mimetic warfare, emotional contagions, and the physical reshaping of our minds. And if you don't know who Mitch is, uh, well, he is the founder and head of research of the Meme Lab, as well as Inpatient Press, which you definitely need to check out. So first of all, I wanna applaud Mitch for presenting this uh, grand narrative of the US military strategic manipulation of human minds via neural warfare, AKA internet memes. 
Um, I think it's an incredibly densely packed information bomb uh, or episode, um, and I absolutely recommend it. Um, first, um, the internet is physically changing our brains. I do agree with this frontal control and addiction, especially in gamers. However, I don't think that these are truly fundamental changes, at least that they're not coming from the effect of online memes themselves. I think that for a substantial change in a species, um, in the species brain to occur, much more time is needed. Also, what is being referred to here are <clears throat> sort of phenomena that are adjacent to online memes, um, simply like being online, using smartphones, just internet usage in general, but not necessarily um, what we could consider the neural processing of internet memes themselves. Then the second point um, is Pepe neurons. Although I think that this would definitely be a very sexy concept in cognitive neuroscience, uh, it does take much more than one neuron or even a set of neurons or the brain to engage with uh, processing something as complex and highly granular like memes at least memes today. Also um, in the show, Mitch refers to Jennifer Aniston neurons, um, which are also called concept neurons. And if you don't know, these um, are neurons fired to complex, but very specific concepts or objects. And the reason why they are named uh, Jennifer Aniston neurons is that um, the researcher who found them accidentally um, while investigating um, epilepsy in the medial temporal lobe, um, saw that this neuron was responding to images of uh, Jennifer Aniston for some reason. It's really weird. But apparently another subject had a Holly Berry neuron, another one had uh, neurons that responded to uh, Bill Clinton. Um, so we don't all have Jennifer Aniston neurons, um, nor is there one neuron whose sole job is to recognize Jennifer Aniston. Um, so the scientist who found them, Rodrigo Quiroga, um, believes that these neural associations are the basis of how we form memory. He believes that um, there are neural networks associated with particular concepts and that these networks uh, interlap. So basically that it's not just one neuron or like a small number of neurons, it's entire networks that code for something um, this complex. So this would explain why remembering one particular person or place can you know, lead us down to a path to remembering many other previously forgotten things. And in the same sort of logic, uh, Mitch proposed that we might then have pepe neurons in the brain, really be part of the brain's memory and association system in the same way that we associate the concept of the Eiffel Tower with um, the concept of um, Paris and then the general concept of cities and places. So my point is that um, this doesn't entail um, a meme specific neural response, but rather the brain's general way of remembering and associating concepts, um, even very complex ones, um, which often are also highly different in different individuals. Okay, so now we're gonna go a bit into evolutionary neurobiology and neuroanatomy. So, I'm sure you have seen the, the smooth and wrinkly brains. Um, and what this is, is a process called gyrification, um, which is basically the process of forming these characteristic folds um, of the cerebral cortex or the outermost layer of mammalian brains. And what this allows is um, a larger surface area and also um, greater cognitive functionality to fit inside a smaller space. So one advantage of this process of gyrification um, is thought to be increased um, the speed of brain cell communication um, because these cortical folds allow cells to be kind of closer to one another, um, which would require less time and less energy to transmit neuronal uh, signals. There's also evidence to suggest that there's a positive relationship between uh, gyrification and cognitive information processing speed. So traditionally, this layered cerebral cortex um, found only in primates and other mammals was thought to be a prerequisite for the emergence of consciousness. Um, but some birds 
<clears throat> such as the members of the Crow family, also show very sophisticated cognitive behaviors, um, suggesting conscious experiences. But in contrast to mammals, birds have evolved really radically different brain structures without a cerebral cortex, since they diverged from the primate lineage 320 million years ago. So birds in general were once thought to be kind of devoid of complex reasoning skills because they lack the neocortex. But what they do possess, um, however, is a group of nuclei collectively known as the pallium um, that have been proven to carry out neocortical-like higher order cognitive functions. So crows in particular um, really like continuously made behavioral scientists marvel at their learning ability and problem solving skills. Uh, including a surprising ability to discriminate quantities. Um, so it seems that consciousness emerged either before or at least independently. Really, really diverse and fascinating cognition uh, make us sort of reconsider the phenomenon of online memes um, in humans and think about it through a more ethological or more evolutionarily um, relevant framework. So just imagine that uh, you're an alien species observing human behavior and try to apply that same perspective now to the studies that I'm about to show you. Um, also, I'm not really going to focus um, so much in depth on the study, but rather I just want to introduce the, the, the width of how far these studies go. And um, really it's a large field of animal behavior and it's often overlooked by a lot of neuroscience. Okay, so let's begin with birds. Um, so to see whether crows have aspects of working memory, uh, which is the ability to remember information for future tasks, um, Andreas Nida and his team at the University of Tübingen in Germany um, trained crows in a task that required them to recall images one second after first seeing them. So during these, um, this task, the team recorded activity of individual neurons in the pallium, which is the area that I mentioned. Um, which is thought to be kind of corresponding to the mammalian prefrontal cortex. It's really interesting to kind of ponder on the question of why this is. Um, and other studies looked um, at 28 different bird species. And what they found was that songbirds and parrots can have as many and sometimes uh, even more neurons packed into their brains compared to mammals, even monkeys and apes. So these tiny but really densely packed neurons are thought to give birds um, incredible cognitive abilities that sometimes outstrip expectations and uh, in some cases are definitely even more than a match for primates uh, with similarly sized brains. So parrots, songbirds, corvids, including ravens, rooks, and crows um, have the highest densities of neurons in their forebrains, which kind of offers up the idea that what birds lack in size they more than make up for um, in their sheer number of brain cells. Okay, then in 2016, a team of scientists um, discovered that dog brains, um, similarly to those of humans, can compute intonation and meaning of a word separately. And this is really incredibly fascinating because dogs are a speechless species, um, at least they don't speak our language, yet they do respond correctly to our words. Um, for instance, some dogs are capable of recognizing thousands of names um, of individual objects and can link each name to a specific object. So when the scientists studied um, brain scans of um, pet dogs, they found that theirs, like ours, process um, sounds of spoken words in a hierarchical manner. Um, so analyzing first the emotional component um, with the older region of the brain, which is the, the subcortical regions, uh, and then the words meaning with the newer part, the cortex. So this discovery really deepened our understanding of how human language evolved, um, just one example. But most strikingly, dogs and humans last shared a common ancestor some 100 million years ago. So it's likely that the brains of many mammals respond to vocal sounds in a similar way. And dogs aren't the only species that can exhibit vocal language, of course. Um, for example, rodents emit uh, something called ultrasonic vocalizations which are sounds that are outside the human hearing range mostly, um, that signal um, incredibly specific emotional and social features. 
For example, I used to work in a lab where we would um, record um, ultrasonic vocalizations in rats um, using uh, ultrasonic uh, microphone. And then what we would do is that we would look at the bioacoustical features of the sound itself, like the frequency, the duration, the shape, etc. cetera. Um, and this would enable us to kind of categorize what the animal was trying to convey, whether it's fear, happiness, aggression, separation from its mother, etc. So it's really just another example that things like language and communication and meaning is something that is also present in the animal kingdom um, and to a great extent. Now something entirely different. Um, a new test for cephalopods, um, which include um, animals like squids, octopus, cuttlefish, etc., ha um, has reinforced how important it is for humans to not underestimate animal intelligence. Um, so what they used here is something called the marshmallow test or the marshmallow experiment, which is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, they, they would place a child in a, in a general setting in a room with a marshmallow. And then the child is told that if it's uh, able to manage not to eat the marshmallow uh, for 15 minutes, then it will get a second marshmallow and then will be allowed to eat both of them. So this ability to delay gratification demonstrates cognitive abilities like future planning, um, for example. And um, it was originally conducted to see how human cognition occurs. Well, it can really be um, adjusted for animals. And um, obviously you can't tell the animal that they will get a better reward if they wait. But uh, what you can do is train them to understand that better food is coming if they don't eat the food that's in front of them um, straight away. So what they did here um, last year is um, basically they did this marshmallow test with cuttlefish and they wanted to see if they can refrain from eating um, a meal of crab meat. Um, once uh, they learned that uh, they will get something much better um, shortly after, like a live shrimp. So they placed the cuttlefish in like special tank with um, these enclosed chambers that had transparent doors so the animals could see. And uh, these chambers had um, the snacks. So basically it had the less preferred um, snack and then the more preferred snack. And the way that the researchers signaled this to the cuttlefish is that they used um, symbols. So um, the doors on these chamber chambers would um, elicit different symbols. So for example, a circle would mean that the door would open um, straight away. It's really crazy. The cuttlefish learned through these symbols that if they refrain from eating their first snack, that they will get a much better snack later. Um, so in species like parrots, primates, and corvids, this delayed gratification um, has been linked to factors like uh, tool use, which really does require planning ahead, um, food catching, and social um, competence because pro-social behavior um, benefits social species. So I think this is really another fascinating example of um, really higher order cognitive processing in um, an animal that you really wouldn't think was able to do it. And now a very interesting study uh, where pigs were trained to play a video game. And uh, what these researchers did is um, they presented the pigs with like an arcade game-like setup, which was originally designed for um, rhesus monkeys, um, which would operate it with their hands. Um, but the pigs, however, had to use um, their snout to move the joystick um, which also required looking up and down during the game. And uh, surprisingly with uh, treat-based training and like positive encouragement from their trainers, the pigs were eager to get screen time. Um, so according to the, the neuroscientist, Lori Marino, who conducted the study, um, she said that the, the pigs clearly understood the connection between their own behavior, the joystick and what was happening on the screen. Um, and what makes these findings even more um, important is that the pigs displayed self-agency, which is uh, the ability to recognize that one's own actions can make a difference. Okay, um, so now another incredible study in evolutionary psychology, which was published last year, where bats um, were trained 
to select arbitrary symbols on touch screen um, in order to elicit a desired behavior of their human caregiver, like you know, giving their food. Um, so I think this is really just another example of um, how this often overlooked um, ability um, to perform incredible cognitive skills in animals is uh, just overlooked in neuroscience in general. And I think this is why the study of animal behavior is becoming more and more um, relevant. Um, and it's really interesting because we associate um, these behaviors with humans, like for example, operating a touch screen. Um, so these touch screen proficient bats could potentially um, in the future participate in more cognition research. Um, and it would really allow us to study like their um, numerical competence or categorical perception and really further elucidate how non-human animals can learn and perceive uh, the world. Okay, um, so finally, the last study I wanna show you uh, is not even a real study, but rather a project um, by an artist called Michael Markovici, which was called Rat Traders. Um, so for the project, Markovici trained uh, dozens of rats to detect patterns in the foreign exchange futures market. And to do this, uh, what he did is he converted um, price fluctuations uh, into a series of notes played on a piano. So if a price went up, uh, the next note was higher. Um, and then he kind of left it up to the rat to predict uh, the tone of the note that followed. Um, so with some prodding, the rats really began forecasting price uh, changes. And uh, Markovici said um, that they were actually outperforming human traders after a few months of training. Also, um, then uh, in an interview, um, I think it was five years ago, he said that multiple hedge, hedge funds apparently were interested in testing his rats. Um, but uh, apparently this didn't kind of pan out. Um, and while this project was obviously a joke, uh, it does open up questions about behavior that we thought was special to humans. So the rats obviously didn't understand um, the full extent of what they were doing, but nonetheless, this example can show that non-human animal can be trained to perform a human task and perform well. Um, so if we go back to um, this sort of alien um, perspective of animal and human behavior that I mentioned, human and rat traders are um, essentially performing the same thing. And this um, brings us to the concluding remarks of my talk. The behaviors we might consider inherent to humans could actually be learned and trained in other species. And we aren't even aware of how far this could go because we focus so much on intelligence in humans. I think that we need to be aware um, of what is um, traditionally considered a meme. So now to kind of relate it back um, in evolution and behavioral ecology. So meaning a special kind of behavior that you learn to imitate and replicate and that propagates um, through a population of a species. But in the case of online memes, it's kind of different. They aren't as consistent in their meaning, um, except maybe when using um, a meme format, for example. But even then, um, the meme evolves so quickly that the original meaning is entirely warped and uh, very often just fades away. So I think that this process of online meme dispersion, layering, and recombination is something that adds to their banality and eventually um, becomes really difficult to grasp and define. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't be possible to study online memes uh, through different lenses, uh, whether it's you know philosophically or artistically, but I think it would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to do so through the lens of biology. Um, still, I think, what could be possible is to investigate um, phenomena that are adjacent to online memes um, as it already has been done. Like for example, studying um, the effect of internet on uh, attention, uh, modulation, uh, humor, higher order, semantic layering, like associative thinking, etc. But not really meme specific responses, at least not with the current 
technology and understanding. So this is why I wanted to offer this um, sort of unusual perspective from the study of animal behavior as a means to maybe help us reconsider and dissect what online meme culture and human really entails. And this is simply a set of diverse behaviors that were learned um, and are also changing on the go, but are ultimately not special to just online memes in particular in this uh, format. So these examples of animal behavior relate to something we consider inherently human, like internet use, you know, video games, language, humor, rules, trading, or you know, higher order semantic processing. And I think that by keeping an open mind to these studies and insights um, of animal cognition, we could really alter our understanding of the phenomenon of online memes. And uh, I do understand that this is a very extreme, but also very grounding um, perspective. And it's also very speculative. Um, but what I do hope is that it kind of can, you know, it can remind us that intelligence and behavior can exist in different forms in the animal kingdom. And that, uh, you know, perhaps if we let crows hang out on the crow internet for long enough, they might start shitposting. Um, okay, so I finally um, want to dedicate this talk to the two ethereal beings that inspired me through the pandemic. Um, first, there is Navar. Um, he's a white borzoi who uh, became my best friend and uh, we kind of developed a special kind of kinship um, in this very lonely year and uh, personally this deepened uh, my understanding and also interest in the concept of like a companion species, canine cognition and generally interspecies friendships. I also want to thank Blade, um, the Drain Gang CEO for inspiring me with uh, Drain. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. This would be it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ivana. That was amazing. Um, I have so many questions. Um, and this is the Q&A portion of the talk. So um, if anybody would like to uh, ask a question to Ivana, Personally, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Or if you want me to read a question, just drop it in the chat. But what I wanted to start with, um, again, amazing. Did the research offer you any insight into how you might construct a neuroimaging experiment relating to internet memes? Like, did you have any sense of that while um, putting this together? Um, yeah, totally. I mean, this is something that I really started off with. Um, that was kind of my initial question, like, would it be able, uh, would we be able to study how we perceive and experience online memes? And um, I, I think that um, animal research gave me a sort of like a grounding perspective, um, if that makes sense, just to kind of um, take another look at um, the behavior of that we exhibit in online meme culture. Um, but the more I researched um, current cognitive neuroscience of, you know, traditional memes and not even online memes, the more I realized how difficult it would be to study this sort of phenomenon. Yeah. I think you're muted, Nick. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, no, that's super fair and a very um, complicated question. Um, we actually have Mitch here, mm -hmm. uh, who cited in your talk, who would like to speak. Um, Mitch. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. What's up? Thank you so much uh, for speaking and giving this incredible lecture and for helping the meme lab uh, establish academic uh, hegemony. And so what I would like, my question for you is basically, given like ideal conditions, like you could have subjects who knew about memes or understood these contextual like reference what kind of experiments would you design like what's an experiment you would love to do about brains and memes like if you just could like right like what's kind of your dream setup i would love to hear hear how would you what you would want to experiment like what you're looking for you know just that kind of stuff <laughs> 
Yeah, um, I mean, I think this is, you know, definitely a very relevant question. And often as a scientist, um, sometimes I'm kind of limited by my own knowledge of what is physically possible. Um, but I think it's nonetheless very important to um, keep like speculation in mind and really envisioning the like what if scenario. Um, so I think ideally how I would approach this um, is probably just putting people in an fMRI scanner um, while they are looking at um, memes, like maybe like while they're scrolling through um, a sort of like meme page or something. Um, and I think this would be kind of like the first thought of an experiment. But then I really thought about the, the longitudinal aspect of this. And I think, um, you know, MRIs are really huge machines and uh, it's, it's very complicated because you have to, you know, get a person in there and then it takes a while to get the brain scan. Um, but if we could somehow track neural activity, like let's say continuously um, in a period of like a week or so, um, it would be very incredible to see like uh, how meme, um, for example, as new meme format appears, you basically like a variable EG device, uh, which I'm aware, you know, it is, but this person would record um, their own neural activity throughout the week while they're kind of, you know, following the, the development of one incredible to see. Um, if there are any specific changes. But then again, I'm always really limited by knowing um, just how much complexity goes into online memes. Because a meme, it's not just, uh, it's not just a concept. Um, it's several different layers of meaning. Um, there's also a lot of visual aspects, like artistic elements, um, aesthetic references. things so, so complex. And uh, it's really difficult for me to right now imagine how you could approach it, but I would never say that it's, it, it would never be possible. I hope that answers your question somewhat. Well, I wanted to follow up that question um, with one. It did, it did, that... Thank you, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. Um, I just wanted to follow that up with a personal question I had, which is you talk about the many layers of meaning that come with memes and their content, but at the same time, in your talk, you sort of suggest this emptying of meaning through memes. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could parse a little bit how you judge this emptying of meaning from digital content in relation to our lived experience, but mm -hmm. also then how that works in relation to um, the sort of multiple meanings that you're speaking of. Um, right. So, yeah, I think this is a good point. Um, and uh, it, it's a really broad topic. So I really didn't have time to kind of address everything. But the way I see it is, I kind of began by looking at, okay, are there any cognitive neuroscience um, that study memes, even the very traditional idea of a meme, like a learned behavior or um, something that you imitate. And um, I did find this one study. And basically, in this sense, what they use is um, they, they kind of focus on meaning as something that you could track in the brain. So if uh, the meaning of a certain concept changes over time, you could sort of see how this affects the brain differently. Um, but then what I know from personal experience is that um, memes right now, uh, in my opinion, are very close to kind of not having any meaning very often. And what I think happens is that um, through this very intense and heavy layering, very often we kind of forget what the, or, you know, we, like, whatever, like the, the first initial meaning doesn't become the same. So it's just layered so many times. Uh, it's like really, it's deep fried so many times that you don't really know what the original point was. So the, the meaning in online means is something much fluid and difficult to grasp. And that's why, because we don't have an appropriate like psychological concept or framework 
on how to, how to like approach this, it's really difficult to then quantify them uh, in an experiment, if that makes sense. I think you muted again. I got to figure that out. Uh, <laughs> um, Ed, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Hey, hey, everyone. Um, uh, hey, thanks, Yolanda. That was an amazing talk. Um, I have, I, I wanted to ask, I mean, point out one thing is that there's a really interesting kind of division in the thought that you're proposing about how we should think about memes, right? And uh, which is at one hand, you have this kind of, you want us to remind us to get back to the kind of original Dawkins uh, uh, definition that meme, a meme is a quantitative unit, right? That a meme is a quantitative unit of meaning and you are defining meaning as learned behavior. Right. So that's very exciting because it opens up a whole kind of uh, once you start thinking that way, it opens up a whole kind of uh, possibilities for research as you're bringing up. Right. But also what you're talking about is that you do hit a wall because you realize that human memes. Right. The actual memes, not memes as quantitative units, but memes as cultural uh, objects of expression. Right. The meme as we have it in our everyday life are very complex, right? They are as complex, uh, and this is why, you know, we have the meme lab in the film department here, is they're as complex as any work of art, right? So I am curious if you have interacted with any, there are cognitive studies of the perception of art by humans in its complexity. And there are also attempts to quantify the experience, aesthetic experience. Um, I've read a few things uh, that, I feel from my perspective as a kind of qualitative guy, I find to be rather, um, yeah, not successful in capturing the complexity of the art experience. So I'm just, my question is, have you looked into any of those things or, yeah, as you approach memes, they are really as complex as those kinds of things and there is research in that area. So yeah, that's my question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that is definitely a very good point uh, because, you know, memes today are undeniably like pieces of conceptual art. Um, but uh, I do have to disappoint you a little bit, at least from my side. I, um, I'm not really so much in the field of cognitive neuroscience. Um, so I'm not super familiar with uh, the field of uh, neuroscience art, um, which, you know, is a very exciting field, obviously. Um, I did work on a project that kind of um, interacted uh, with this a little bit, um, but it was about cannibalism. Um, and I know this is really out there, but I, I had to really think about the um, aesthetic elements of uh, images that I wanted to present to uh, the participants in the study. So, um, yeah, I did consider um, kind of like the psychological dimensions of this, but um, I'm not so familiar with the, the neuroscience of art. And I think that is a separate field. Um, and it would definitely be um, interesting to kind of dive more into it um, and compare this to the study of memes. Yeah, um, maybe not uh, the most satisfying answer. No, oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to start reading some questions in the chat. Uh, Diego Pagnini asks, I'm interested in studying what the images of the future will be like and how they can shape our emotions in a positive way to take back the social future through online. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I'm a little bit confused. I mean, this seems like a really big statement. Um, mm -hmm. Could you maybe, could you maybe like repeat it? Maybe if uh, Diego. Sure, and Diego, if you could have any um, follow up uh, points to this, but uh, or if you want to speak. Um, yeah, 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 sure. I just like. Yeah, but uh, Diego said I'm interested in studying what the images of the future. Already, maybe we could wrap that into memes um what the images of the future will be like and how they can shape our emotions in a positive way to take back the social future through online i guess it's a question about what do you think um the capacity of 
memes and mimetic image circulation will be like in the future and the social effects of that seems to be what uh, Diego's asking. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a huge question and I'm definitely not qualified to answer it. And uh, as, as a scientist or a scientist in training, I tend to not make big conclusions um, unless I you know, perform experiments. Or even then you really approach questions with a lot of caution. So um, I can really speak as, you know, like personally, and this is just my own personal opinion. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, memes already have a significant effect on our lives um, and uh, culture and aesthetic preferences and social circles and communities. And, you know, obviously, especially after the pandemic, like a lot of people are online and they're just kind of finding new ways to synthesize their interests and like connect with people. And this has a really big effect, but uh, thing format to this and this is that memes are kind of like visual forms of humor, like jokes, and they, they will always be visual online. And um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to consider whether, you know, other like sensory aspects can be somehow included, but it's really difficult for me to imagine uh, that also yeah just making these sort of big conclusions um i'm really cautious with that so uh it to disappoint you <laughs> no not disappointing at all um i'd like to follow up uh with a question by anthony hayner thank you so much for your amazing presentation i realize that this is a Big question, but the phenomenon of morality being studied from an ethological perspective. Uh, I am thinking in particular of the work of Jonathan Haidt and his moral intuition theory. Can we begin to distinguish at the neurological level concepts or memes that revolve around care, fairness, community, authority, and purity? Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, thank you and good luck with your fascinating and important interrogative research program. <laughs> Wow, what a nice question. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a really good question. I'm actually not familiar with that uh, theory, but um, I am aware um, of like neuroethics and the entire field of morality. And there's there's research going on into whether um, whether neural correlates of morality um, exist. And um, I mean, I briefly mentioned, um, but for example, the the cuttlefish like marshmallow test. Um, is one of the examples where um, animals sometimes exhibit like um, future planning, um, which is important in pro-social behaviors. And um, ethologically speaking, as someone you know who is going into animal research, um, I can definitely say that there is a lot uh, to do with morality, and especially a lot to explore. Um, something I I, I can say for sure. And I don't know if this really answers the question, because um, as I said, we, we tend to think about intelligence kind of um, work on a similar topic is um, about keep um, in uh, rodents. So my former lab um, investigated um, whether there are neural correlates of uh, kinship or sort of like kin preferences. So basically, how can we know who belongs to our family and uh, who doesn't? Um, so they performed experiments where um, they would, um, for example, separate um, the mother from her pups, um, rats and mice, and then um, basically look at, you know, brain activity while this process was happening, but also at these ultrasonic vocalizations that I was talking about. And in terms of kinship, there, there does seem to be an area, um, it's called the lateral septum, and it's a very old area um, that seems to encode um, kinship-related preferences. And in humans, um, there were several um, FMI studies that found that the area is kind of active 
when people um, either read scenarios or see like pictures of their family. Um, so I think uh, kinship is a really important kind of like pro-social element. Um, and I think morality is something that's not directly linked, but is definitely adjacent. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of morality itself, I, I can't think of any other research directly now. And I, but I do think that, you know, memes absolutely have a big role in, in morality and especially with uh, political beliefs. And, you know, I, I recommend listening to Mitch's radio show because he kind of talks about um, potential ways to utilize memes to manipulate political beliefs. And this definitely relates to morality, yeah. Thank you. That was a really thoughtful answer. Thank you so much for the question, Anthony. Um, uh, this is a question, and I think I have a thing to bounce off of this question with, but Cody Fabricant asks, uh, there is a dog, parentheses, poodle mix on TikTok called Bunny, who has been trained to communicate via buttons on the ground for different words like poop, outside, mom, dad, etc. Do you think that an animal can become self-aware enough to develop irony once having learned a language? And then I don't mean to bombard you with questions, but to follow that up, you did dedicate this talk to your own dogs and you do many memes with them. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, this connection between animals being able to participate in memetics as well as being one of like the world's favorite subjects of memes. Um, if you could talk about that a little bit afterwards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I've seen videos of this dog. Uh, it's it's really incredible. And it always, always amazes me because I'm obsessed with dogs. Um, actually, um, I, I should have clarified um, that Borzoi that I showed was um, just a dog that I was babysitting. But I was really watching him every day. And um, that was kind of probably the deepest connection with a dog that I ever had. And it really affected me because it was during the pandemic and I was alone and I would just hang out with this beautiful ethereal dog and uh, kind of really, yeah, really developed a, a connection. Um, but uh, it, it's a bit of a difficult question of whether they can develop. I think, I think so. Um, but um, I think there's so much that we don't know about canines and canine cognition. And actually, if you're interested, um, there's there are a lot of new um, research groups, especially on Twitter, um, that promote canine research, which um, is really becoming like a growing field, especially with newer imaging. Um, there's more and more studies where um, people investigate like uh, brain responses of dogs to different things and just look at whether different dog species have different brains. So I am absolutely fascinated with canine cognition and um, this idea of a companion species because, you know, compared to other animals, dogs are perhaps the most close to humans or have been evolutionarily. Um, and uh, I can't remember if I read this full thing, but I think also Donna Haraway wrote about um, dogs a lot. And uh, I think she wrote something like the, the Companion Species Manifesto. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the name is, but I would kind of you know recommend going into that because um, Donna Haraway also had dogs and was really into dogs. So yeah, I, I hope this somewhat answers the question. Amazing, thank you for that. Um, uh, Daniel Shinbaum asks, do you see the internet folk knowledge around neuroscience and the scientific knowledge of memes reaching towards a common understanding in any way, i.e. my last brain cell, smooth brain, return to monkey? Do these memes reflect neuroscientific discourse? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, Actually, now that I think about it, um, they they do kind of reflect, I mean, I wouldn't say it's always like the most um, contemporary um, or up-to-date neuroscience discourse, but now people definitely, you know, know about like smooth brain, wrinkly brain. Like I would, you know, talk about people who are not neuroscientists and, um, you know, just show them like images of like dolphin brains or something that are like huge and like very like, 
very important. They have a lot of folds in them and then they would know because of the memes. So I think that there are definitely some meme formats that kind of popularized um, like different concepts. But also I was gonna um, talk about Return to Monkey because I think that um, it's really interesting, not only um, politically, but also um, especially in this sort of ethological sense um, and this desire for us to go back to like reject humanity and go back to like a simpler form of cognition, of intelligence, um, or not, not even simpler, just kind of try to forget um, everything that we reached as a human species and this really like higher level um, processing and, uh, you know, go back to something that's more uh, like primate, like um, in the real sense. So yeah, I don't really know what this could mean in the full sense of like neuroscience discourse, but uh, it, it definitely is making more people aware of neuroscience. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, uh, Castle asks, or no, I'm sorry, um, doing all right actually asks, has this research helped shape your view of intelligence in general as we experience and perhaps even share it with animals? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it significantly affected my my view of intelligence and especially interactions with animals. And um, actually um, in the last couple of months, I think I spent like most of my Twitter feed has been just studies in animal behavior because I, I followed like a shit ton of animal behavior um, accounts. And there was even like this, uh, they called it a Twitter conference where people would just present things as like threads so there was a recently a twitter conference on animal behavior and there were so many studies from like species you would really like goats like goats all sorts of monkeys insects like cephalopods dogs cats like there's just so much research and it was everything kind of together in one place and yeah, it was incredibly fascinating. And uh, I, I'm still continuing to learn about intelligence and cognition, but I'm really, really interested in animal forms of cognition or just general cognition, not viewed um, necessarily as something so crucial to, you know, being a human or having a, a neocortex. Um, so yeah. yeah. Okay, and then um, I'll ask this question, then we'll wrap it up. But um, has anyone tried to break down cognitive processing into identity to identify features that make memes or ideas in general spread successfully, much in the way that you get fitness of certain genes in genetics? Mm -hmm. Wait, can you can you say that again? Um, I think yeah. A... yeah, definitely. Has anyone tried to break down cognitive processing to identify features that make memes or ideas in general spread successfully much in the way you get fitness of certain genes and genetics. Mm. So is there any corollary for memes? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a good point, but uh, we have to just remember that, you know, the current research um, is dealing with memes in this really traditional sense. So it's really not what we think of as memes uh, today. And, uh, I don't, I, I can't think of anything in particular right now in terms of um, traditional memes, um, at least not in neuroscience, but um, I could probably think of um, studies of, um, you know, how like political beliefs disperse and why certain people are more prone to um, believing certain things and certain ideas. And I think this is also kind of becoming more and more clear, like why certain groups are simply more prone to believing you know, like you can definitely check out like QAnon or anything like sort of like cult thinking and why cult thinking occurs. And uh, if you analyze the profiles of these people who are more susceptible, um, you can definitely see patterns emerging. But I think for now, um, these patterns would mostly be um, kind of psychological or social. I don't, I don't know about any neuroscience behind this, at least not yet. Amazing. Thank you so much, Yovana. That was fantastic. I really, really loved that talk. And um, everyone who was watching, I know there was 
a few connection issues, but we will be able to, um, you will be able to watch it in full again on YouTube. The talk was completely recorded and we will have selections of this talk published in our journal content. Um, that's content of a medics journal, which you can read at memelab.org, which I just, oh, that's not right. Memelab. Oh, it keeps doing a space. Well, you can find it online uh, at memelab.org. It's called content and you can read original pieces there now by Tiffany Shaw and Markella Zanelli. Um, and then also make sure to keep uh, checking in. We are going to have a wonderful talk uh, March 23rd, March 23rd with Aaron Taylor, uh, AKA ATM fiend, uh, in conversation with Cecily Chen. And then April 6th, we're going to have Bard College memes in conversation with Patia Borja of Patia's Fantasy World. Um, and yes, thank you again, Giovanna. That was uh, such an interesting, fascinating perspective and really wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you guys for inviting me. I mean, it was a pleasure and I'm glad people enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.